so much, everyone. I can't see anything. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, I know I'm the only thing that stands between you and getting a drink or even better, your bedtime. So I'm going to go really, really fast. Um, and the talk is called It's Not Nice That because I'm going to very quickly describe the kinds of work that I do and then I'm going to describe a couple of the issues that I've come against, particularly now that I've started freelancing. So, as Matt said, I'm a data journalist. That means that I take numbers wherever I can find them, uh, and they end up being in all kinds of weird places. Um, and I turn them into either written words or illustrations. And obviously, for this particular room, I'm going to try and talk a little bit more about the illustrations today. And when I'm designing these illustrations, to put it like really, really simply, I'm often thinking of just kind of two criteria. There's actually more criteria, but this is just a simplification. Um, so clarity and beauty. And like the worst charts, I guess, kind of fail at both, on both of those scores, right? So they're ugly and confusing, like this. Um, and then you have the charts that are pretty and confusing, which I think are almost worse because they kind of like bring you in. So like this. Um, and then you have the charts that are ugly and clear, like this. Um, and then you have what I'm like really, really striving towards trying to create, which are charts that are pretty and clear and not confusing. And obviously with journalism, that's absolutely critical, right? Because I'm trying to inform people and make sure that they can um, have the right information that they need to make decisions for their own lives. So to do that, I kind of take the classic chart types that I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with, and then I kind of turn them into these hand-drawn illustrations. And it was so interesting to hear Anna talk because one of the reasons why I create hand-drawn illustrations is because I really want to communicate to the audience the human component of data gathering, right? And the fact that a human was responsible for collecting these data sets and also to communicate how fallible this, these data sets are, right? So when you look at one of my illustrations, Hopefully you walk away with like a sense of what the data is telling you, but I don't ever put decimal places on things, because the truth is we don't know things really to decimal places. Um, so I'm going to talk you through like a specific example. So those first three examples I gave of bad charts actually all came from this one study that I found, um, which was looking at inequity in consumption of goods and services add, <laughs> adds to racial ethnic disparities in air pollution exposure, which basically means that um, people of color in the US are more exposed to air pollution than white people. So I tried to take those charts and create a hand-drawn version of them, right? So this was my first version. Um, and whenever I'm designing these charts, I have like a group text thread which unfortunately my sister who's in the audience today is on that group text thread and I, I send it to people who do nothing to do with data journalism and I say to them like, do you get it? And very often they're like, I, I don't get it. Like, this is a bad chart, right? This is a bad first draft. What the hell does like micrograms per cubic meter mean? Who knows? Um, so this is the second version of it. I did some arrows, doesn't really do anything. Third version, this is called a sand key chart, where it's like about the width of the thing. But this isn't something that like, how many of you really know what, how to read a sand key chart? Not particularly useful. And then I just like really, really simplified it and just had it as bars. And like played around a little bit with the language as well, so that's the final version of it. Um, I'll zip through a couple of other examples of my work. So this one uh, was in the wake of Hurricane Harvey. I'm trying to show flood levels in the US and... Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's funny, but it's also kind of not funny. So this is like a photograph of Trump after he was like distributing. It was so it was so awful. He like went to the community that was affected and was like throwing toilet rolls at them as if he was some kind of like savior or something. But the goal is that I feel like most people have a sense of like the president's height, maybe. Like, you know, he's not necessarily a short man. He's actually six foot two. But the idea is to use him for scale, um, partly because if nothing else, it reduces the number of numbers that I have to show on the chart. So in every single time I'm designing one of these things, I'm trying to eliminate the number of numbers on there and the words that are on there so that it's as simple as possible. Uh, a slightly lighter topic, Google searches for hangover cures, um, <laughs> which plummet throughout the week and then peak on like su <laughs> Sunday mornings. And then, a very critical topic, um, adults who have experienced rectal bleeding. Um, <laughs> one of the very few examples <laughs> where a pie chart is acceptable. Um, and then, male circumcision rates. Um, and then back onto a more serious topic, this was after a report was released in the US looking at uh, crowding in immigrant detention centers. And this one was actually really, really interesting, the methodology for creating it. So I don't know if, I don't know if it was really big news over here, but they, these photographs were released in this PDF that showed how crowded those detention facilities were. And I spoke to someone at 
I think it's called the School of Forensic Architecture in Kings, and the way that they work is fascinating. Like one of the photographs showed a migrant holding up a letter, so they could figure out the dimensions of the room knowing the dimensions of an envelope, because they were actually holding up an envelope, and then figured out how many people were in the room. Anyway, I worked with them to figure out the maths on it and came up with this illustration. Um, again, like quite simple, but um, hopefully quite effective. Um, and I realize I've put in too many examples in this. I'm just gonna quickly go through the next ones. Um, this is for a piece that I did yes, that was published yesterday on how dying in America has become very, very expensive. Funerals are now very expensive for people to pay for. Um, so I think it's that the cost of dying has gone up 223% over the past 30 years, and the cost of living has gone up 123%. And as a result, people are doing GoFundMes to pay for their loved ones to be buried in appropriate ways. It's horrific. And occasionally I'll also do like, you know, less charty, kind of more editorial stuff. So this was an animation that I made to go with the piece. Okay, so on to these three issues. So how many freelancers are there in the room? Okay. <laughs> one, one measly freelancer. Are there, are, is it really not many freelancers here? Okay, some, okay, great. Because I think I'm gonna lose some of you at this point then. Okay, um, so I started freelancing about a year ago and as I'm sure you know, it is hard. Um, and so I just wanna be quite transparent about some of the issues that I faced, especially if maybe some of you are thinking about going freelance if you haven't done it already. Issue number one, is getting paid. <laughs> um, so I, I'm gonna make suggestions here that may or may not be useful, take them if you like. I have um, a very, very inefficient system, but it works for me, which is that I have this like mega spreadsheet of all the projects that I'm working on. Uh, I, I, I took like three different versions of this screenshot because some of them had like snarky comments about people. <laughs> um, um, and I'm sure I still probably missed something in this, but uh, gray means that I didn't do it, orange means that um, it's a maybe, green means that I did do it. Um, and this is a way for me to track, like have I followed up and actually asked for payment? Because they're kind of counting on you for getting. And when it's sometimes like a smaller job that's like 100 quid, it is sometimes, if you're juggling loads of stuff, easy to forget. So I wanted to show you um, what, first of all, the importance of asking for money. <laughs> so um, this is now my go-to response. I say to people that I only do unpaid work for charities and non-profits. It is quite extraordinary, the number of for-profit companies that will ask you to work for free, and I really want to let them know in as polite language as I can that what they're doing like isn't okay, and this is the wording that I have landed on. You can also choose to simply ignore them, which I think is also quite effective. Um, uh, idea number two, if you, don't, if you want to get paid, is maybe don't try and pursue the gallery route. I mean, some people are very, very successful at it. I tried to do an exhibition last year, this is the behind the scenes of the breakdown of that. And I ended up spending $5,278.50. And this was me being like as constrained and as cautious as I possibly could about every single dime that I was spending. And I didn't make any of that money back. And I wouldn't do it again. So um, I think like, you know, it's really, really hard because for so many of these things, I guess you should be going out and asking for funding. But that to me is also horrific because those funding applications can take weeks and weeks and weeks, and it just feels like you're rolling the dice. Who knows? So, um, coming back to this idea of actually making sure that you get paid, I wanted to just talk through what one of these examples might look like. So, I'll try to do this quickly. August, I submit an invoice for an illustration that I do for a very, very renowned company. This is not, this is being filmed, so I can't say who. Um, and then, in September, I follow up with lovely Henry and tell him, hi, could you please pay me, in other words. Um, and then in September, I, I hear from Lauren, who lets me know that she's on it and I'm gonna get paid. And then I chase again in September, and again in October, because I still haven't been paid. And then this really, really wonderful thing happens, which is that the person who now represents me as a lawyer writes to Lauren and says, hi, Mona hasn't been paid yet, and within like hours, the payment is issued to me. And I honestly think I would have had to have chased this, and this was like about a half a year's worth of work, 
Like, and I don't think they planned on paying me, is the truth. Honestly, like, they are so renowned for not paying people. And I guess, like, I know it's difficult. It's only now that I've been able to get a lawyer. They take 5% of everything that I earn. I know that I'm being filmed, and I know this is a terrible thing to say. Have someone else pretend to be your lawyer. <laughs> like, it's, it's an option, right? Like, she doesn't know who, like, Daniel Serkin Law is. Like, have your mum create an email account or something and just follow up with people because it really seems to be the most effective way to ensure that the money does, in fact, hit your account. Okay, uh, problem number two is actually getting work. So this is another like painful example that I guess I've learned is I receive many emails that are like this, that are like, hi, we have this really, really, really exciting opportunity for you. Would you please sign this NDA and we'll jump on the phone? Now I have become much, much um, more careful at reading every single thing that I sign. So this particular NDA said, contractor agrees that during the course of contractor's business relationship with company and for a period of one year after this business relationship terminates, contractor will not directly or indirectly, <laughs> alone or with any other person or entity, solicit or do business in any capacity with any client of the company or with uh, <laughs> any potential client of the company with whom contractor had contract contact during the course of contractor's business relationship with the company. And what this means is that I can't work with anyone in the same space for one year. I don't even know what this project is yet. They've just said they want to get on the phone with me to pick my brains. And they want me to sign something promising I'm not going to work with anyone in this industry. I don't even know what the industry is, by the way. This is a creative um, company brand. It's like an agency that got in touch with me about their partnership. So it's just like, no. <laughs> like, I don't want to sign this. And what's really interesting is that, like, first of all, like, they really, really pressurized me to sign, and I was like, I don't want to sign it. And I said, can you at least tell me, like, what the fee for this project would be? And after much, much pushing, they eventually told me that the fee was going to be $200. Like, why would I sign away the possibility of doing work for one year with anyone in this industry for $200? So basically, read NDAs. If possible, do not sign them ever, ever, ever and try to get as much information as you can before you do sign. Okay, um, third and final thing is getting your ideas stolen. I often get emails like this, as I'm sure many of you do, which is like, can you just send us all of your ideas for this particular project, and then we'll let you know whether or not we'll hire you to work on the project. And I think it's really, really hard, because I've often found myself in this stalemate where I, like, if I don't give over the ideas, then it never progresses, and I'm never going to get that contract. Um, and I feel like now, hopefully, I have enough of a portfolio to just be able to say, like, hopefully, if you look at my work, you kind of get it and should be able to trust that I can come up with some ideas on this. Um, but I would also say that I try as much as possible now to leave such a rigorous paper trail. So if I do send over ideas, I say explicitly in the email, just so you know, you don't have permission to use any of this in any capacity or any way. And then hopefully, it's harder for them to kind of wiggle out of it. Um, so finally, so that you can all go. I wanted to um, suggest a criteria that I use when I'm trying to decide whether or not to say yes or no to a job. So I try to check at least two things off of this kind of like mental checklist, which are I want to either earn some money, um, learn something that's going to help me professionally, or help. Like I get so many project commissions that are from nonprofits and charities. And like the truth is with all of these, like do I know if the work that I'm doing is particularly helping? Like, do I know that I'm actually doing good? You really, really don't. Um, but if you can foster a good community, whether it's like your sister that you're texting to ask her her opinion on stuff or other people that you know in the creative space, it's so helpful to understand whether or not you're checking those boxes. That's everything, thank you. Thank you.